This time around on Atomic Friday, we're going to be taking a look at a sister project of Atomic Red Team, which is the Chain Reactor. Uh, this was born out of some very unique, um, how, do, how, what, how do I say, it? some very unique specifications for software testing over on the Linux side and making sure that we could have some detection validation on that side. So um, we can go ahead and kick it off and get started. There we go. All right, so some of you that floated around Red Canary webinars have probably seen me before. I'm Tony, I work on the intelligence team at Red Canary and I work on the Atomic Red Team project here and there. Um, been here about three years-ish and it's, it's been a blast. And with me today is Mr. Carl Petty from our uh, cloud workflow team. And he is one of the most awesome people that you will ha ever have the chance to not know is working behind the scenes. So. Let's, let's do an introduction, Carl. Thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Carl Petty and I, my history prior to coming to Red Canary is working in the in intelligence community doing um, software vulnerability research. And then I had an awesome opportunity to come over here and work on the other side of the fence, which is protection. So I'm bringing that knowledge of attacking things um, with a defense mindset. So yeah, I lead the research and development team on our cloud work workload protection product. And, and give you guys an idea of like kind of the awesomeness that is Carl. Like one of my first introductions to him trying to like run this run sort of like, here's what bad guys do across to him. His, the, one of the first things he said was like, I'm not really sure how they do it, but I know how I would do it in a previous life. So right about then I got a little bit of chills and I realized, okay, let's never make this man mad. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a good experience so far. And I uh, wanted to call out somebody that's behind the scenes today that is helping us out. So if you have any questions that are getting triaged behind the scenes, uh, or you may end up hearing a voice if he comes in, we also have Mr. Brian Donahue that is helping us out uh, behind the scenes today. So um, do a kind of a quick overview. We want to, you know, this is a light agenda. We can vary from it a bit if we want to. It's you know, Atomic Fridays are really informal. So if you have questions, feel free to ask and we're more than happy to try to address them. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about what Chain Reactor is. How is it different from Atomic Red Team? How do you use it? And give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like when you're trying to use it. How do you like put it into effect in your particular environment? To kind of get us started, like get us a little bit down the road of what is Chain Reactor, Carl? Yeah, sure. Um, so Chain Reactor at its heart is a framework for simulating Linux attack techniques. So during our you know, <clears throat> design and development of our new uh, cloud workload protection product, we wanted to have a tool that could validate um, and rapidly test on different, all different types of Linux distributions, all different types of Linux kernels that our sensor was actually A, doing what we thought it was and be detecting um, known Linux attack techniques. And so with that mindset, we created a standalone test tool. Like the framework itself is not standalone. I don't, it requires, you know, build tools and things like that, but the binaries that are produced by the framework will run or attempt to run on any Linux kernel or in Linux, any Linux distribution. Whether or not they actually work is, is dependent on the distribution and its configuration but uh, we are not dependent on any of those things. Um, it is highly customizable. Uh, we wanted to be able to rapidly share, you know, quote unquote playbooks, we call them reactions of, of different um, attack techniques. And we wanted to be able to do um, the same thing in different ways. And we'll talk about that a little later, but really it's at, the heart, at its heart, it's being able to specify which system calls are actually chosen by the, by the executable or by the, by the test tool. And I, and I love the kind of the really being specific of calling out the distribution versus, you know, standalone core thing, because I know with a lot of security tools, a lot of software that's out on the market, it is really specifically tied to, yeah, we just support Ubuntu or we just support Red Hat or all the different stuff like that. Like this gives Chain Reactor the, you know, just by focusing on kernel version alone and kind of tackling that sort of thing, it, it it really sends a message like, we don't really care what you guys use. We're gonna help you try to test it. Um, we don't really need, you know, this one unique, you know, God knows what package from Ubuntu to try to make everything work. You know, we're, 
we're here for the kernel. Yeah, and we, we fully understood that problem on the CWP team. We didn't want our Linux product to be any more than an installation for customers because we know that there are others that require you download kernel tr tool change and build things. And we, didn't, we did not want to have that requirement because um, we know that it's a maintenance nightmare for, 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 for customer teams. Absolutely. So sweet. Kind of, now we can kind of take a look at what makes up Chain Reactor, like all the little like specific language terminology. Sure. Yeah. So we have uh, reactions, atoms, and quarks. This is what we call them. Um, I'll start with the, the, the small e smallest unit first, which is a quark. Um, so that's the smallest unit of execution. And you can think of these pretty much as a one-on-one -on -one representation of some Linux system call, like opening a file or writing to a file or creating a file. Sometimes there are more than one. It just depends on what you're doing. But um, it's, it's our smallest unit. There is where you'll specify which, which sys calls you want, you want to take. Um, atoms, which are a unit on top of quarks, are just a, simply a list of quarks. And these are tended to represent a single attack technique, like executing a hidden file or um, creating a, 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 you know, a reverse shell listener. And then on top of atoms, we have reactions. And reactions are intended to represent a single incident or mimic some rat or some type of malware tool. And the reason why we have these broken down into distinct units is we wanted test teams who adopt this tool to develop an atom that does one thing and be able to reuse it across multiple different reactions. That way they're not um, you know, spending most of their time managing these long lists of shell commands. They can create well-known little gadgets that they can reuse throughout many reactions. And that and that that really strongly reminds me of like the Unix philosophy: do one thing really, really well, and then reuse it as much as you can. Yes. Yep. That's uh, that was our mindset too when when building this. Awesome. And if it'll move, all right. So yeah, I just wanted to briefly uh, touch on what a syscall is and why it's important. Um, so on Linux and on most operating systems most modern operating systems, the, a syscall is the interface for a process to talk with the operating system or the kernel. Um, and this allows a process to do things that affect other things across the system, like creating new processes or creating files, writing to files, creating network connections, creating servers, uh, listening, listening sockets. So that's what a syscall is and that's what, what its intent is. And on Linux, there are, a great many of them. There are over 300 now on the latest version of, of Linux on the x86 architecture and AMD64. And there's a great number of different ways to do the same thing on Linux. So for just for an example, if you wanted to write to a file on Linux, there are 12 different distinct syscalls you can use to write to that file. And from an EDR vendor, and also from a, an attacker's perspective, those are 12 different uh, interfaces that you care about because um, some of them are easy to introspect, meaning that it's easy for an EDR sensor to hook right, right? Because it's a very common syscall and it, it's straightforward and it does what it says it does, it writes to something, right? But you may not think of, you know, hooking splice because splice could be used for writing to a file. So when we're developing both defensive and offensive products, <clears throat> you consider the entire attack surface. Um, so that's something that we try to incorporate into Chain Reactor as well. So you can see the coverage that your security product provides. And uh, we wanted to, to really highlight that because we feel like we do a pretty good job of catching most of everything. <laughs> well, and something that uh, something that we talked about previous to like coming on during like the practice session, um, uh, there's several of these syscalls that do seem to be like uh, a dual dual function sort of thing because I know looking looking at MMAP, I'm used to seeing you know MMAP being memory map, you know working with things in memory or ptrace being related to debugging, but like there they, there's some like magical stuff behind the scenes where they can also be used to write to files. Correct. Yeah. So mem, mem, just picking MemMap um, for example. Uh, when you memory map something, you're either allocating, you know, what Linux calls anonymous memory, which is stuff used for like stacks or heaps, or you're, you're allocating some type of file backed media. And if it's the latter, um, you can use that to write to files. So you can memory map in a file and touch the, mem uh, the addresses in the process's virtual address space and write to them. 
And the, C, the CPU behind the scenes, when the, those pages are invalidated, actually will perform that write to disk for you. So there will be no syscall for actually writing to the file. Um, so that is a common way and a very fast, efficient way to do file accesses. But it also makes it incredibly difficult to track accurately. Um, if you know if a, if a write actually occurs to that page or not, it's difficult to track. So that's a, you know, a good example of a kind of a, a way of going about typical write operations would be min mapping and using that, uh, that functionality. Uh, I'd be interested to see how that like affects forensics tools and, to, and things like that as well, if like that affects like last access dates and stuff like that, but that's story for another day. Um, yeah. But uh, in talking through, talking through that, something before we kind of move into the demo side of things, something I do kind of want to hammer home to the audience is that, this is, it's kind of different from Atomic Red Team in the sense of implementation, like it's vastly different in the sense of implementation, but the philosophy at the end of the day is the same. So the philosophy between Atomic Red Team and Chain Reactor here is that, you know, we know that security tools are flawed. Every tool is, anybody that tells you it's not flawed is lying to you. And we, you know, we just need to know what those flaws are. We need to know what aren't, what things aren't covered, what things are covered. You know, how do they work? And you have that understanding to make it a richer experience in your environment and help protect your org. For Atomic Red Team, the implementation is largely at like the command line, like process sort of interface or that sort of level. You know, we, we think of like ingress tool transfer uh, as, a, as an MITRE attack technique. If we look at that as an Atomic Red Team uh, test, that's going to be using curl or that's going to be using PowerShell to bring something in. This works at like a level below. So instead of, you know, what would ingress tool transfer look like to atomic, uh, to the chain reactor here, this would be using a system call to connect and pull in data. You know, being able to do something like that. This is the sort of thing that isn't as easily modified on, you know, the command line that you have to know a little bit of C programming or you have to know a little bit of at least Python of how to manipulate, you know, system calls and you know a, a programming language to be able to do. So this this kind of democratizes that to an extent. So awesome. So uh, want to go ahead and you know, jump over into demo land if we can. Sure. And if you will... hear a screaming, a small uh, screaming child, it's my one year old. So ah. I <laughs> no, no need. We all have velociraptors running around in the, in the house in the middle of quarantine. Um, so while we're getting the demo stuff going, one thing I do want to also uh, point out for the crowd, if you have questions, concerns, anything that you want to bring up in the conversation, uh, feel free to do so. Probably here in the chat will, will work, but there's also the general channel of the Atomic Red Team Slack. Uh, I'm looking at that, so is Mr. Brian Donahue in the back. So we're both gonna be looking through and seeing if we can answer any questions or concerns that you guys have. So yeah, take them away, Carl. Thanks, yeah, so I kinda wanna go over um, the files that you will be most caring about if you, you adopt this tool and use it. And we'll start with the highest level, which is that reaction, which is represents a single incident. Um, so picking out on one of our examples is we see that it has a name and this is just for your own tracking. You can name it whatever you want. And then we have various different atoms and these are what are, ex are executed in order. Um, so that's, that's all a reaction is, is a name and a list of atoms. So in order to find out what the atoms actually do, we need to go to a different file. Uh, and this isolating it to its own file allows you to share, share these atoms easily, easily. So let's go look at that. So over here, we have this JSON file, which is just a list of objects. Each object in here is an atom. The, every atom has a name. <clears throat> and then after the name are quarks. And we have all the full list of quarks documented in our, in our readme in here. So we can, we'll go through and I'll show you um, where that's at too as well. But for example, I just wanna look at these, um, these first three and kind of talk about them a little bit. So this is a, a quark that executes a binary on the system. And the binary is who is, and those are the arguments that are passed to it afterwards, right? And it uses the exec ve syscall. Um, the next one is very similar. 
except it uses execv at and it's executing curl and it's hitting this pastebin site. So on Linux, there are two ways to, ex to um, exec a new binary and it's execve and execve at. If you're familiar with um, C programming, you may be used to seeing a whole bunch of like exec LP, exec L, um, all, there's a whole caveat of exec functions, right? Those are all libc implementations of exec that are built on top of these two syscalls. So these are the only two that matter to the kernel. And we'll, I'll show you that, I'll, I'll highlight how that works um, here in a little bit. And you can see a very clear example <clears throat> of what the user space program is attempting to do when you call exec L or exec LP. This third one down here is exec is, is kind of a, a two attack techniques in one. It's execing from memory and uh, self-deleting executable or yeah. So one of the things we do is we copy the existing chain reactor to dev shim, which is a memory file system. We then exec it. And this is just a special command line argument for chain reactor just immediately exit when you see that. And then we delete it, right? So that's kind of represents a exec and, and delete. So let me kind of show you, let me switch over to, I wanted to show you how these are documented real quick before we switch to the terminal. So we have this, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's preview. This is better. Uh, so we have this markdown file, which goes through and enumerates all the different lists of what everything we just talked about are. And if you want to see the specifics of, you know, each, each one of these quirks, you absolutely can. And the arguments. So this, this one right here is fork and rename. So this is kind of, kind of actually cool. This will let you mimic binaries that are not actually present on, um, on the system that you're on. So fork and rename says who is, ooh, go back. I didn't want to double click that. So the fork and rename will execute who is H red canary P four, four, three. So it'll ex execute a binary called who is. Now who is does not need to be installed on the Linux distribution for fork and rename to work. Um, fork and rename is kind of special. It, it creates a, a copy of the chain reactor program in um, a separate folder, renames it to who is, execs it as who is. So traditional t uh, EDR telemetry will see an exec of who is with all these command line arguments. So it'll appear as if you're actually executing who is, but it's not actually who is. So this is kind of the folly of tracking things at that level, right? You, you, you're more concerned about um, the actual actions or the syscalls that are occurring on, on an endpoint, which is something we aim to do in, in, our, in our security product. But I, I wanted to point this out that they're all well-documented here. You can go see all the different arguments and how they behave and, and such like that. Let me switch over to my terminal. And something cool, like while you're switching it there is that yeah, the way the way it's documented, it also seems like it'd be easy to, or I say easy, uh, simple matter of learning how to program and getting that going. Um, the ability to like add new quarks based on, you know, what syscalls you want to emulate. Yeah, no, for sure. Like we're, we are incredibly open for anyone who wants to contribute new quarks to chain reactor to contribute them. And in fact, you know, we've kind of been super busy this last year making the product uh, CWP. Uh, so there will be some additions that we'll be adding to, to further add test support for our product as well. So it may appear like there hasn't been a change in a while and that's true, but changes are coming. Um, so this is just a checkout of the GitHub repository that I think has been linked in Slack. So ma making it simple, we use make. If you have um, the build tools for uh, dependency installed, this will just work for you. Um, so that's as simple as that, making, and then you're done compiling. That's all you need to do. After you do that, um, you're going to use this script to compose a reaction, right? With this script, you're gonna point, you're gonna point it at the reaction file as well as the atoms file. So running it, we'll display what you need to do. So atom, reaction file, and then output. So I'm just gonna compose one of our examples. Action, I think it's there. And then we use this atoms, right? And then the same thing again. You can create these and manage these independently if you want to upload new examples to the repository as well. That would be awesome. 
And then this is the reaction. And then finally, I'm going to save this to a file called, um, you know, detection test. Okay. So that ran, ran. And if I go look, you know, at temp detection test, we can see that it's a 64 bit executable that's statically linked and it's stripped. So that essentially means it'll run anywhere without any dynamically linked libraries. And as long as the Linux kernel there and has all the syscalls that we that we're looking for, it should work. So let me run that and let me show you what it what it does. And I, I have to say for the folks that have never been exposed to the particular brand of suffering that C programming is, this is much better than trying to make your own binary to do what you're the equivalent functionality. Like you, you would end up spending like a weekend of pain trying to make this work. Uh, so running it, you get a very large banner, which you can remove. Um, here, I'll, I'll just do that real quick so I can show you that it, it is possible. I think it's, uh, remember let me let me scroll up the command line argument for it tech tech no banner okay so we don't have to see that Run it again okay so you'll get in pretty print output what each of the atoms executed it did and if there was an error the error would be displayed too as well but these all seem to work so Highlighting, let's go ahead and highlight. I'm gonna look at these first two execs and see how they differ from a syscall perspective. So what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a tool called Strace, which is system trace, which attaches itself to a process and prints out all the syscalls that are happening. So I'll do Strace and then I'm gonna do a filter because I don't wanna see everything because this program will do a lot before the stuff that we care about happens. I'm gonna look for exec VE, and exec v e at. And then I'm going to do tack F2, which means follow any children or threads that are created as well, just to make sure I get everything. And then I'm going to run test. All right, so that was a lot of output, but let's scroll up a little bit and go to our very first atom. So we can see over here that the exec is about to happen. And then we're gonna see all of the execs. So this one, we're gonna be looking for the one that does who is, cause these are all, these all happened before um, our call. So this is this is where, the, where actually the process is going to create the who is process. And remember how I said earlier that um, libc and other libc implementations, not just GNU's libc, but um, Bionic on Android or, or whatever implements a wide variety of exec, sys, uh, exec function calls that are all built on top of this. So this one is clearly using the exec LP, which means exec from the path variable. So look, look in the path variable for all the different places that this binary can exist and attempt to execute it. So you can see it does exactly that. It starts at path one, which is the current directory. Is there a who is binary in my current directory? It goes and it tries it. And you can see that it's failing with E no entry, no such file. So it'll do that for every... Yeah, yeah, it'll uh, it'll do that for every single uh, directory in your path. So finally, it, it goes back to one of the one of the things in your path is user bin, and then it does it attempts to do that, and it, it finally succeeds. That's what that zero zero is for. So at exec two is cool. And now let's go look at exec ve at. A little different, right? You see exec VE at, and then the path <clears throat> is zero. And the reason for that is the at syscall is a little different. You can see here that there's no path like there is up here. This is because it uses a special descriptor um, to find that, that file. So the syscall itself doesn't have a, a clear text string path to point to what was actually executed which is an additional step that your EDR vendor has to support in order to display that information correctly to you in the cloud. So it's a, it's a, it's a reason why we added support for it and that we wanted to make sure that it worked is we, is we added that. So um, that's the, the demo that I wanted to show you guys. Um, and 
you know, you can do this with any, with any syscall that you want. You know, this is just a good, good validation. You know, we could do open or open at two and we would see all of those too. And we created this tool, like we said, to, to go over all these different ways of doing the same thing. So you may run across malware someday that does something really weird that you're, you just don't see happen, um, but it added an entry to your Chrome tab, for example, and it was just missed. And, and kind of talking about using this to an extent to, to emulate things that malware does do. Something that I, I know we had talked about being very explicit about is that there is a very, very explicit difference between this project, which we're talking about detection validation versus adversary emulation. Um, right. With adversary emulation, we feel like there's, with, with adversary emulation tools, there are some shortcuts. There are some things that help you be a bad guy easier so that you can try to like exploit a system. Adversary emulation, this is going to be things like Cobalt Strike. Yeah, doesn't count as adversary emulation if it's what bad guys actually use, but things like uh, Scythe or products like that that kind of accelerate that process, that's going to be more along the lines of, ad of adversary emulation. The, there are no shortcuts here to being the bad guy with this detection validation tool. This is you know, we're getting really fine grained control to be able to, um, to be able to control the different nerve knobs that we're tinkering with. We want to really figure out, you know, can we see this one particular syscall? If not, let's figure out how to get there. Right. You know, we, we, we adversary simulation tools, like, like you said, they represent the concrete implementation of doing something bad, right? And we're not so concerned about mimicking the bad part. What we're concerned about is mimicking the bad parts behavior. Um, so we, we wanna focus on disjoining the actual implementation of a bad technique to do bad things to just the bad technique. And what we found focusing on that is we're able to catch unknown malware uh, focusing on things like that. A lot of tools will look for watermarks or things that are explicitly related to um, bad tools and we stay as much as we can away from that. Because if we develop a solution that detects specific things, we're only gonna catch the things we know about. And as you well know, there are many things that we don't know about. Absolutely, and and something I do kind of wanna just state out right too is that as a company, we've, we, we take the philosophy that with offensive tool, like offensive security tools, there is a need for offensive security tools in the security space, but we're very much trying not to clutter that space with our own creations. Like we want our creations to be able to be for validation and testing and actually, you know, be something that is not very readily weaponized. You know, right. something that if we, if we publish it on an MIT license today, can somebody go out and put it into a macro tomorrow and go rule the world? Now nah, that's probably not going to happen. Yes, we try to stay, uh, some, have somewhat of a Hippocratic oath in our authoring of open source software. Um, uh, we will highlight, you know, specifics of bad things and blog posts, especially a few that are coming in the future, but we don't find it valuable, nor is it necessary to release something that could be so easily reused to do bad quickly. Uh, if you focus on the behavior uh, and remove the specifics of the behavior, uh, you, you're going to you're going to yield the same thing, and that's that's kind of the mantra that we follow. Yeah. So, do you have one question to to take a look at? It was. Uh, from Mr. Olaf saying that he really likes the process, uh, the approach that we have in general with this, that it's more realistic than the original art project, uh, where you did, it really like lets you granularly control things. So, um, wondered if there was also be a direction to have a similar sort of thing for this on Windows. So I know that the CWP stuff is doing primarily Linux. Do you happen to know if there are plans for a, a, a Windows iteration of something like this? Uh, well, for CWP, I think, especially for the mid future, uh, yeah. short to mid future, we're focusing exclusively on Linux. Now for Chain yeah. Reactor, it's entirely possible for us to add extensions to, um, to, support, to support Windows. And we are also 
completely open to someone who wants to take on that work too, to contribute to it. We truly do want this to be an open source project, not um, a red canary open, you know, red canary employee only open source. Um, the difficulties with doing this on Windows, and this is just a difference, uh, you know, a key fundamental difference between Windows and Linux is that Windows doesn't support static linking uh, as easily. And the syscalls do change quite frequently. So targeting the syscalls on Linux uh, on Windows like in the same manner will be difficult. Uh, an alternative would be targeting function calls out of NTDLL, which would probably be a better way of going about this. Uh, it, it, the translation would be similar, but there would be a little bit of nuance. Um, Windows has this philosophy of use our tool chain and, and don't do anything that we, you, we don't want you to do, which works for them. Um, and, it, and it's great. And it, and it completely isolates their ABI and all that stuff and makes maintenance for them and backwards compatibility for them awesome. Right, because they can, if they wanted to, they could change a syscall and it wouldn't matter to any programs that are running on Windows. On Linux, if uh, Linus decides, hey, I'm gonna add a fourth argument to this syscall, every process in Linux will break. It, it, there will be a huge, huge rumbling and the world will crumble and 90% of the internet will die. And um, so there's just kind of a different mindset of, of how, how they make software between the two, the two uh, operating systems. But, it could definitely be done. And the, I think the intent of what you're getting at could, could be achieved pretty easily. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, talking about, uh, and especially talking about like the focus on the Windows side, something that you might, in, something that you might enjoy. Um, we haven't had as much of a, of a demand for this specific type of project on the Windows side a lot, but at the, um, something that we have been working on from the research, the applied research side of the house with Matt Graber and folks are atomic test harnesses. Uh, when they do a particular deep dive into one particular technique or another, like I know we've done MS build in the past for atomic test harness stuff. Uh, hopefully coming out pretty soon, we should be having a process herpeter being one uh, which I never thought I would say that term on a webinar, but here we are, 2021 is an unusual year. Um, so hopefully we should be having more of the atomic test harnesses coming out soon. And again, as, as for the philosophy of, you know, we, we try to make sure that we're not cluttering that offensive security space. We're trying to also time, you know, test harness releases with detection capabilities that exist because we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're just not tossing something into the wild that just gives someone the ability to rule the world. Like now that uh, I think, think one of our big discussions with this week was, hey, Sysmon now has the capability to look for herpiderving. That means we can publish, yeah. And like be able to like do that sort of thing. So hopefully keep your eyes peeled. We should be seeing some of that soon. Okay. Uh, so there's another one from Nichols. Do the Adams are aligned with attack Linux techniques regarding simulating malicious behaviors. So, so yeah, you can, oh, go ahead. I, let me let me share that um, this one more time. So atoms are user defined. So you can make an atom be whatever you want. Um, and this, in this case right here, this Linux S, uh, uh, shared memory dir execution, we tried to target uh, the attack technique of in memory only execution, as well as self-deleting uh, executable. So what we do is we give you the tools to define those atoms that, that represent attack techniques. And I think mid to long term, what we want to do is we want to have a library that represents, you know, attack techniques that are, that is uh, very attic in the sense that you can say, I want to do um, shared memory execution with this executable. And that way it'll be a one-to-one -one representation of the attack technique. That's all that logic is all supported. We just need that library of atoms to, to do that. It, it, it would be so cool. Like if they were just, just planting this seed for people that exist out in the wild. Like if there was like extension to the invoke atomic framework or something like that, to, that would actually pre-populate, like make some of these atoms for you. Like, Hey, I plan on doing this in reactor, you know, hit that menu option of the atomic, uh, you know, invoke atomic 
PowerShell framework and it spits out the file for you to actually be able to go and execute that. I would, I would love yeah. that. Yeah, we definitely could tie into that to that integration. And uh, we've been do it, talking a little bit about where Chain Reactor should live, if it should live in its own repository or if it should be you know, within the Atomic Red Team um, repository. We're still not sure of the best place for it yet, but we, we do we do want to make sure that it's it's easily vis visible and easy easy to use. Awesome, that works. So, all right. So we got done with that question. I don't see any more offhand. Do you have anything else you want to cover? Oh, one more. Would you suggest? How would you suggest getting started building out that library? Uh, shell scripts on VT. So getting started building out the library. Ah. There's a few different ways. Like the 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 way that kind of I think of it is like that if you're just doing this on like a researcher's spare time sort of thing, do what sparks joy for yourself and what makes you excited to like go and check it out, go and test it out. If minor scripts really excite you, then yeah, God bless you, go go work on that. The other part is what what threats um you know, what threats affect your organization? Like if, if you have a mandate for management that says, hey, we really heard about this and we want you to participate, you know, maybe take a look at, you know, if you're in financial services, you know, and you really worried about SSH brute forcing, you know, how would SSH brute forcing look in telemetry? Like being able to replicate things like that or, um, you know, exploitation, uh, exploitation of a web app using a specific binary like this. So there's a, there's a few different ways that you can get into it. What are your thoughts, Carl? Yeah, I mean, uh, to whatever, whatever, I think whatever um, you're experiencing the most in your, in your environment are, are the tech techniques I would start with. And I guess it may be difficult, sometimes may be difficult for to, to actually discern what, what the tech techniques your malware is exhibiting. So the way I do that is I, I reverse engineer the malware. Like I, I pull it apart in a program like Ida and I actually go look and see what it does. Or like I, I dynamically look at it. But that's hard and, and it takes a lot of knowledge and, and it's a long time and right, not everyone's gonna do that. So there are, I think there are sandbox tools that, um, for, especially for Windows, a lot of great sandbox tools where you can throw a binary in and it'll spit out like every action that it does. Another thing that I, that I would, the way I would probably approach this problem is I would want complete coverage, right? If I were just maintaining this project and that was my only job and um, I would go through the entire MITRE matrix and I would, I would piece together every single attack technique and I would create an explicit, um, an atom for each one. And that, that would take a long time. Um, but that, I think that's the, uh, an easier way of doing it without reverse engineering the things that you most care about. And there are a lot of attack, attack techniques too, which um, makes it makes it a little bit more difficult. But <clears throat> a lot of the most common ones, like you know, executing a hidden file, self-deleting executables, um, you know, things like creating creating listeners on weird ports, um, things like that, would would probably be the most most commons common atoms to make first. And um, yeah, I, whatever floats your boat, really. And I could, I could specifically see like when you're talking about uh, the things like using ports, one thing that really immediately comes to mind for me is there was one attack technique for port knocking. Mm -hmm. And that I honestly don't know how I would do an atomic test around port knocking because I mean, you, you're, you, you're not gonna have a bad guy out there that's doing like, all right, if I do this particular combination of curls, I get into the server. No, it's going to be like some sort of like, binary that's you know doing the sequence so like you could probably more readily do a port knocking type test with this rather than atomic right yeah absolutely yeah there's you could use the connect um atom or the connect quark to simulate port knocking where you you know target a specific server and you enumerate ports you know 10,000 through 20,000 you know I think the existing atomic framework would rely on a tool like inmap with command line arguments to do that right but you wouldn't have exact control um, over it. And you want to be specifying the syscalls yourself. You would be relying on inmap being on your machine and all of, all of these things where you could easily represent that behavior with, um, 
with small little quirks that simply just reach out and try to touch that port. Awesome. So yeah, what else do we got for demos? Do you think? Uh, that's all. That's all I had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, one one final question. Lost connection for a bit. Are we running the test locally, remotely? Looking to remotely launch simulations at test machines. Oh, sure. this is yeah. going to be good. So, uh, can you? I guess so. If in the sense of remotely launch tests, like so, to to remotely launch this test, you would need a, a means of deploying the, the executable there, right? And I'm assuming you're talking something like SSH or some tool like that, which you totally could do. Um, and you could, you would just you know use SCP, push the file over, and then SSH exec it, and that's it, right? You wouldn't need to install anything. There wouldn't be any 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 you know setup required it would just it would just work um now if you wanted to get a little bit more fancy you could uh set up something like meterpreter and you could use meterpreter exploits to gain remote access to that machine and then you could encode um a chain reactor executable as the payload and that would be a you know a, a realistic way of testing it from how you probably see it in the in the wild um, these things happen I like your definition of fancy. Um, so sweet. So as for who to talk to about uh, support for some of this stuff. So Olaf, uh, if you're looking for uh, support or if you're looking like to, to try to integrate it with some of the things in yours and you have questions like coming and finding us on uh, the GitHub repository for chain reactor should work out. And also the repositories for um, Atomic Red Team. Uh, and I think there's also an Invoke Atomic one. I could be wrong. I got to go back and look at. But uh, any sort of that stuff right there uh, on the Atomic Red Team Slack as well. And also, if you're looking specifically for you know somebody, I believe Matt Graber should be able to answer questions about the test harness folks. Um, and then... Carl and folks like where where we tend to be easily found on Twitter, and if you can't get the can't get immediately the right person, just pretty much ask anybody, and we can get you to the right person. Where where we're an easy bunch to talk to. Yeah, and I am. I believe I am in the Atomic Red Team Slack. So if you had explicit questions about this, you can reach you can reach me there. Um, I will respond to you eventually. I promise. <laughs> and yeah, like any, anyone who's open to contributing to this, we, we, we're more than welcome to A, accepting your work and B, also, if, if you're new at this type of stuff, more than happy to give you code reviews and do some type of mentoring about how we, should, how we go about implementing different solutions. All right, then uh, the, the, the questions are coming in slowly, but they're drying up. So, uh, so one, another one, uh, can this target Linux-based containers? Absolutely, yes. B beautiful question, yes. We can, we can target containers and that's one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we could do. And we're container agnostic, meaning you can run us in any container, any type of container, Ubuntu, Arch, Alpine, whatever your favorite thing is, um, you can run us in that. Yeah. And my, my favorite thing about containers so far has been uh, listening to Zach Brown say, uh, containers are just processes. If anybody tells you different, they're trying to sell you something. That's true, yes. So yeah, we, it's a little bit magical, but like it, it'll work, it'll run. From an operating system perspective, it's pretty much the same thing, just with a, yeah. a few extra steps, if you will. That works. So, okay, so if you wanna unshare yours, I can finish up here and we can let everybody get on with their wonderful lunch times. All right, so share. Boom, and we're back. Um, so the difference is we, we pretty much covered the differences as to why chain reactor versus atomic red team for certain things. There's a level of granularity here that you're not going to get with atomic red team or test harnesses around atomic. Uh, that's just, a fact of life. And it's something that you'll see with security tools as well. There are some security tools that are really worried about syscalls. There are some security tools that are really worried about log entries. Like it's just that the difference is knowing what your tolerances are, what you need to be able to make things work. So 
this work for us to be able to look at a, a syscall monitoring solution. Um, for validating coverage, it's always better to kind of validate proactively. Uh, and something we've tried to very explicitly target with the philosophy of atomic red team and chain reactor, because it is the, the way the way it was put to me is it's easier to have the plane built before you need it than try to build the plane while you're using it. Um, it is better to know what your coverage is or isn't before you have an incident. Um, if you have an incident and you're in front of you know a C-suite or you're in front of managers who say, why didn't we see this? It is much better to have the understanding going in that you know we had this blind spot in our in our stuff. We documented this. We needed X dollars to be able to fix it. Maybe we could. Maybe we couldn't. So this gives you the practitioner ammunition to be able to say, I need X dollars to get this kind of coverage, or I need this product to get this kind of coverage, or you know, if we spend a you million know, dollars to get monitoring for this one syscall, does it actually give us anything? Like there, there's a lot of different ways this can be used to help your bottom line in the organization. Sweet, and kind of to, to close on out, if you want to contribute, um, Atomic Red Team and Chain Reactor both, you know, we are very open to getting contributions from the community. We very much want to be a champion of these open source products or open source projects and not the, you know, this happens to be red canaries that they put out into the wild. No, it's something that, you know, we, we actually internally sometimes use things that are contributed from outside in the community. Like this isn't just like, us tossing stuff out into the wild. This is us having a collaborative conversation with the community. So if you wanna be part of that conversation, absolutely feel free to check us out. We're more than happy to kind of get started with a collaboration with you and your organization, uh, be able to like get pull requests in, be able to sort of improve this for everybody because every, every way that you contribute to Chain Reactor or Atomic doesn't just benefit you, it benefits a larger community. So. You know, be, be a good citizen, help out. And if you wanna check out more about Atomic Red Team, we of course have our resources at Red Canary, redcanary.com slash Atomic Red Team. Uh, there's also atomicredteam.io, which is the, the GitHub pages thing for um, the Atomic Red Team project itself. Chain Reactor itself does not have its own little web page, like its own cool branding thing, but maybe it will in the future. Um, but you can just check out the GitHub page uh, for that project and it should get you going with everything that you need. So I think that's pretty much all we've got. Have anything else you wanna cover, Mr. Carl? I don't think so. No, thanks for taking your time and coming to listen to us talk about syscalls. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm.